I'm Gerard O'Sullivan. I'm head of the Department of Technology Enhanced Learning, and it gives me a great pleasure to uh, to welcome uh, Professor Frank Rennie onto the virtual stage today, fresh from uh, last night's GOSTA event. Uh, I know some of you some of you may have tuned in for that. Uh, so Frank is a professor at the University of the Highlands and the Islands in Scotland. Um, it's a highly distributed university, highly successful university, and it really harnesses the uh, the potential and the the affordances of the of the digital and the online. And it's also a university I happen to know that was referred to often when plans were being drawn up for our own regional university. So look, Frank is the right man to tell us about all of this and has a special research interest also in how the online world and digital connectivity can can support regional development, uh, which which of course is a great interest to us also in uh, MTU. But I think he's going to have lots to say also just about the on the ground experience of online um, teaching and practical ways in which we can we can uh, use digital solutions to enhance what we do as as lecturers and as teaching staff. So. Usual format. I think Frank's going to talk for a bit, and then we can have uh, some some questions and some and some discussion, if that's okay with you, Frank. And so I'll I'll hand it over to you. I'll, I'll mute myself, and uh, you can take over. Okay. Thank you for that introduction. Um, um, I would like to kick off by saying that I don't want this to be me just talking at you and, 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 and telling you how, you know, how the world should look, as it were. Um, I, I would, I want to say a little bit, um, and I've got a couple of slides only to show you the sort of geography that I'm talking about. I don't intend to give you a PowerPoint slide or any sort of stuff. What I thought we'd rather do is I'll give you some starter comments um, and then we can open it up to questions and answers and, and discussions and comments, You'd, you know, you'll be relieved. You don't have to agree with what I say. Um, I tell my I tell my two daughters that even I don't believe everything I say all the time. So you you, you have to you have to sort of realise that this is an ongoing dialogue. Um, and although there's a lot of experience that we can share, um, the answer to the question depends where you're starting. Uh, there, there isn't there isn't a sort of one way to do these things or one way that stays in perpetuity to do these things. So there's a whole variety of different ways of approaching online education. You know, as Jared says, that my 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 um my inter my interest my introduction to this um didn't come as a techie person. It came as a person who was doing rural development all through Europe, um and wanting ways to get high quality education out to the end of the, the line, as it were, to the croft gate, to the farm gate, um, and not to not to make people leave rural areas to move to a city in order to get their education. Because what happens by and large is that often, particularly young people, but people in general go there and then they get dislocated and then they cannot go back to where they came from because the job that they were trained for doesn't exist or because they've got you know connections in the city and so on and so forth. So Edu higher education was rather than contributing towards rural, you know, regional development, it was actually making things worse because it was actually getting courage to go away. And so my interest was about how we deliver that um, at a distance um, using a whole variety of different technologies. I began very early days in the Open University just teaching by telephone. And I still remember the first time I actually phoned somebody up cold and said, you know, as a as a 24 year old, I am your lecturer. Um, we're about to talk about so and so, and I was it was absolutely bloody terrifying from my perspective because you know I was expecting someone to turn around and say, you know, who, who are you to start teaching me down the telephone? But you know these things work work well. So I was an early adopter of of the World Wide Web. Um, basically, the year after it was it was made public in the in the early 90s, we, we began to put things like course lecture notes on there. There were no th no such thing as Brightspace or Blackboard or Moodle in those days. It was just purely HTMS, HTML content straight onto the web, no passwords or anything. Um, and so, you know, the highly frowned upon nowadays, obviously. Um, but that was the way that we got access to things. And that was for the rural development classes. That wasn't for the for the computing students or whatnot. That was given access to worldwide resources 
um, that people could learn about development and com community development in rural areas. And what we noticed very, very quickly was that, that students um, began to attend classes less regularly because, you know, why would they drive for an hour to come to our campus for a one hour talk and then go home again and have another talk the next day? So the conventional way of timetabling lectures and whatnot did, just didn't work with us in a rural area. And so rather than some of my colleagues getting a bit uptight about students not coming to their classes, I said, let's turn that to our advantage. Um, why I wouldn't do that, so why would I expect them to go and do that? And rather than give them all of their classes over two days or three days and give the rest of the time off, we, we turned it around as much as possible was on the web, and then we turned the 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 face the, the FaceTime conversations, the things that were really urgent. So they're discussing tutorials and problematic questions and new concepts and so on, question answer sessions that was going to be beneficial to the student rather than coming to them listening to what I was talking about as a, as a lecture, because I could record that and send them a cassette tape if, if I wanted to do that. So um, that was a new way of doing that. And that, that picked up steam. That was probably 1993, I think, began to do that, or 1992, 93. Um, and it's developed since then. Um, so there are a whole variety of ways that we can do that now. What I would say is, um, and I want to open up to, to questions or comments and any, any people have, you know, maybe you can actually field some of the questions if you if you, if you know people um, are raising questions that you want to, to raise and just, sure, just, yeah. just just stop me anytime. I, I don't I don't get flustered by, by being stopped mid floor as it were, to, to, to say something. Um, what I would say is that um, in all the different ways of delivering online education, there are two things that I think, or three things perhaps, that are really, really important. The first thing is there is that um, I've, I've heard it all before. Um, I've traveled the world speaking to different institutions and everyone will tell me that this is a great thing. This is wonderful technology, but it doesn't work for my subject. Yeah, and I go bullshit, absolute nonsense. I, 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 give me enough time and I'll show you how it works. Um, and that's because we tend to come from it from our own perspective and, we, and we, we do the thing we're comfortable with in the way that we learned rather than learning something new and innovative and threatening and quite challenging that actually makes us as subject experts wrong footed uh, and seem to be the, the one that's trying to catch up and learn ourselves. So I would say it's applying to all different topics and all different subjects, some more so than others, absolutely. But I was a visiting professor at King's College London for a number of years, working with the dental school, for example. I know nothing about dentistry, but I was working with them to, to help their, to help their uh, course material for training new dentists and new dental nurses get that online. Because they realised that delivering online meant that you didn't have to remove people from the workplace and they could learn in the spaces in between there. So it was going to be a much more beneficial to them. They could continue to live where they lived with their family and without having to go to the expense of traveling to Glasgow, Edinburgh, London, whatever else, Dublin, um, in order to just go to that face to face. And so they, they minimized what they had to do face to face um, and extended the bits around it that they could learn online. You don't have to be um, you don't have to meet face to face to know that that is a black pen and that is a silver pen. <laughs> And this is, this is the new version of this, and this scalp will be used differently because it has these techniques and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of things you can do online. I think secondly, the thing that, 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 that the objections that come up for looking at online as well, you know, it's threatening my job. If all this stuff goes online, you won't need me. And that is absolute nonsense as well because, because we, need, we need that human contact to actually guide the students through the resources and to help people learn about how to learn. And so the idea of, of um, putting everything online, um, the, the courses that I teach for a, number, for a number of years now, for probably two decades now, have been, you might call them wholly online. Um, I, I would say they're wholly online with tutor support. So we don't, we don't just plug students into a computer and leave them. We design it in such a way that they can learn by themselves, they can learn at their own pace, they can learn one o'clock in the morning or one o'clock in the afternoon and so on and so forth, because it's online, they can look at it again and again, but they have a human 
um, subject expert there that they can interact with to ask questions or to raise problems or to challenge or to share their own experiences and whatnot. So I think the third point is um, when you're looking at the move online, I said last night on the Gasta thing that, it, for example, it, 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 one of my colleagues mentioned that it was like trying to teach people how to swim once the flood has arrived, because all of a sudden they've, they've been resisting um, moving online, they've been, they've been resisting moving away from face-to-face, -face, and all of a sudden face-to-face -face was not an option, and they had to teach online, but they didn't have the experience, they didn't have the confidence, they didn't have the resources, they didn't have the technology, they didn't have the software. So everything had to be learned at emergency pace. Um, and in doing so, it was like teaching people to swim once the flood had arrived. For me, that was not the case. Absolutely not the case. I can appreciate that might be the case for many people. But for me and most of my colleagues, my teaching and tutorial work with the students has continued for the past year and a half, almost without a blip. Almost without a blip. The, the only difference is that I no longer have to drive half an hour to town to sit at a computer in town and do this. I can do it from my own desktop. And my own, I, can, I can make my coffee at breakfast or a cup of tea, walk through, plug it on and start from there. It has advantages and disadvantages, and we can come to that in a second or two. But the key point about this is, it's in the design. If you try and do what you do face to face without any change, without any modification, without any consideration of the strengths and weaknesses of the different technologies and resources of digital materials you can use, you will crash and burn. You will provide a second rate or a third rate or a fourth rate experience because you haven't thought about the materials. It's a bit like having a having a tradesman turn up at your, at your house to fix your washing machine, and then you get alarmed because they open up their tool bag and all they have are different types of hammers. There are no screwdrivers, there are no pliers, there are no cutting tools, there are no measuring tapes and whatnot, just a different set of hammers. And you realize very quickly that it takes more than a hammer to fix your washing machine. You need to have the back off and you need to have you know, screws and so on and so forth. So. It's a bit like that with learning technology. There are different strengths um, of different technologies, and I've written about them quite a lot in various books about what you can do. Um, some things are good for A, but not so good for B. If you want to do B, don't use that technology. Use this one as well. And it's about playing around with some of these to work. Um, in some cases, we can, we can test these things out with small groups. Um, so that you're not experimenting on the students. What I talk about now, really, is developing um, hutagogy. Hutagogy. Pedagogy, we talk about sloppily. Um, we all talk about it. I talk about it as well. You know, the pedagogy of this, that, next thing. Actually, pedagogy, strictly speaking, is about learning with children, as in pediatrics. <laughs> yeah. With learning with adults, the technologies and the practices for learning with adults is called andragogy because andragogy comes for adults with other baggage. We don't come with an empty vessel. We come with our own experiences, our own prejudices, our own strengths and weaknesses um, from growing up over the last um, however many years. Um, it's my birthday on Sunday, but I won't tell you what birthday it is. It's, put it this way, it's, it's long past 21. Um, um, and it's about how, how you do these things. So hutagogy now is self-directed education. And it's about it's not about just telling you bugger off and do it yourself. It's about providing a whole range of resources, like a like a sort of Scandinavian smorgasbord sandwich or a buffet where you can have a whole range of different things and say, look at all this range. What do you want to learn? How do you like to learn? When are you learning? who you're learning with, what are you learning for, do you need to read this thing? Some people like to experiment and do these things rather than just read about them. Others have to read about it first and then experiment and so on. And we all do that. We all do that at different times. This nonsense about um, digital natives, that young people drop out the womb with a natural ability to use technology, that is complete nonsense. You'll see there's lots of research now that shows that the there is as much difference 
within the age groups, within the age bands, as there is between the age bands. So you get young people that can do it really well and young people that can do it really badly. You can get older people um, who, you know, who are very good with technology and other people are they're completely rubbish. Um, I, I would regard myself in that terms as the digital native because I've been around that for a long time. But it has started, you know, after I was born. So by the strict definition, you know, the, the, te- the terminology is actually quite flawed and quite, quite, quite dated. So in terms of using that technology, it's about my skill as an educator looking for ways that I can present to people so that they can learn, they can select from these things to work their way through. And then when they get stuck, they can come back and ask questions or make their own suggestions, their own comments and so on and so forth. In a way, a more traditional style would say, go and read chapter five of the book by McPherson. And then the student comes back and says, well, I find that that chapter quite difficult to understand. I I don't really follow it. And so you might say, well, here's another book by McDonald. Go and read chapter seven in that, because it talks about the same thing, but it's written in a different way, a different style, a different a different person. And the person goes away and reads that and says, ah, yeah, now I understand it. Not because it's any different, but because they've got a better or a more a, a way that sort of chimes with their way of learning. That is the same in the digital variety as well. We can provide videos. We can provide um, audios or podcasts. We can provide images. We can share images with people, still images. We can link people to, to journals to go and read this article if you want to do these things, or we can bring in people to do animations and work, work in progress. Um, early days, we used to use quite often within UHI, we used to teach by video conference. We used to teach like this. And then we realized, um, most of us quite early on, that that was, that was a waste of their technology because you could record that and make it like a television program. The strength of the technology was that you could interrupt and ask questions and we could begin to share these things. And it was a bit like watching a David Attenborough film and then and then being able to say to Attenborough, hang on, whoa, 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 go back to that bit with the, with the gorilla. That was really good. How did you do that? And he would stop and discuss that. And that gives you that interactivity that you couldn't get, you know, in a, in a broadcast format. So I think it's about picking these tools for different purposes. So I'm going to stop there. There's loads of other things I could say, but I don't want to talk the whole way through. Are there any particular issues or questions or concerns? Or, or... Well, great. Let, let's see. So if uh, if people want to put a question to Frank, you can do so in a number of different ways. You can uh, raise your hand and we'll give you the mic. Or um, if you're feeling a little shy, you can use the, the, uh, the questions and answers area. I do see uh, somebody who's known to Frank in the audience there, Tom Farley. I don't know if Tom wants to uh, wants to come in and make a bit of trouble for uh, for Frank there. Are you with us, Tom? I am, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, I love the whole thing you were saying, uh, the Mark Pensky digital native. Um, Do you think it has been an oversimplification, which I think sometimes, you know, the media management sort of latched onto and, and didn't sort of oversimplify something which was, as you said, is far more complex. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we've, we've proven time and time again, Tom, that just because, for example, um, a t- bunch of teenagers are using Facebook um, for their social activities and their planning and their parties and whatnot, that doesn't mean to say they can use that social media technology to learn because... Um, it's, a, it's a huge simplification, but by and large, older people tend to be more afraid of technology, but more disciplined in their use of it, whereas younger people tend to be um, much more cavalier and much less intimidated by, by the technology. They'll try anything. They'll just say, well, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, you know, um, but at the same time, less disciplined in their use of it. And so we have to say, for example, uh, very early days of, of um the students starting with the sort of courses that I'm teaching, we spend some time um, and they, we have an induction at the day. So we, we learned very quickly that that um, just throwing the students at the deep end wasn't going to go anywhere. Just because they can actually use social media or because they can log on and use email and so on, doesn't mean to say they're going to use this technology in a way. It's, it's a bit like sort of um, bringing home a new Porsche and saying to the, you know, tossing the keys to your 14-year-old and saying, hey, you got a new car, go and take it for a spin. Yeah, right, that's going to happen. 
you know, you'll say, you'll come with me first and I'll see you driving and I'll, I'll make sure that you look after her and so on and so forth. So it's about learning that, that confidence to use this situation. I think in the, the early days, we realized that spending a day or even two or three days at the start of the year to do a student induction with them was really, really, really valuable because we can sit down with the student and show the, how, how they could log on to the in a face-to-face, -face, so I can lean over their shoulder basically and check. This is where you type your password, put your thing in here. Um, don't worry about, if, if, if you get that error bar, don't worry about that. You get it all the time. You just need to log on again and start again. Um, this is where you find the library. This is how to use the library section. Here's how to do referencing properly. Here's how to access, you know, online journals or whatever else. You can go through all of these things with them. And so that when they leave the induction and go home, because most of our students work from home, then we know that they can use the system competently and they know that they can use the system competently. It's not a challenge. Um, some of the early days, UHI has got over a, a hundred and something other different local learning centres. We have 13 main campuses, many smaller campuses. Um, I was going to show you that, a, a slide and I, I might do that in a minute or two, but um, we have hundreds of um, local learning centres, um, over a hundred inhabited islands, you know, to go around. So if you visited, if you visited each of the of the um, the the UHI campuses in turn, the main campuses only, and you're to go and visit one a month, you couldn't do it in a year. Yeah, if you were to, I worked it before. If you had to do a, a full day's work on each of the major campuses. Um, and then go to the next one and do a full day's work there and go to the next one. It would take you almost three weeks continual traveling just to do that. So the idea of just popping down next door and picking up something from the photocopier is not an option for us. It is not an option. So we have courses that are taught um, deliberately um, at a distance um, through network teaching. The students don't know that if you're teaching in Dublin and I'm teaching in, in, uh, in Stornoway and somebody else is teaching in Inverness or whatever, they don't know where you are. It's a material to them. They're still it's in the same learning space. However, um, we have courses that are taught face-to-face. -face. Um, some cases, 100% face-to-face. In some cases, it's a, a, a blended variety of these things face-to-face, -face. depending on the subject, depending on if it's taught in multiple places or one place within the UHI network. It's a thing that we're still resolving. We haven't got it right. We, in my view, we haven't, we haven't, we still teach the same thing, for example, technical skills in three or four different places with three or four different um, lecturers and one in Inverness and one in Perth and one somewhere else doing this sort of stuff. We've now harmonized the same assessments and the same course materials and so on and so forth um, in a much more efficient way. But we, I think we've still got a lot to go. Right. So just because you use a technology doesn't mean you say you can use it well. Can, can I jump back in there, Frank? Um, just I suppose, um, and I'm familiar with the, the, the geographical disparity of UHI, and I suppose with our new university, we're very, very geographically disparate. And I suppose we'd also have issues around broadband connectivity. Do you find that's an issue? Because you're talking about the parish. I mean, I might be able to, I might live on a, on, on a country where I have great roads, but like, do you have to temper your design activities because? You wanted to do something, but you know some people just don't have good connectivity. Sorry for the long question. Pretty good. Um, a bit of a bit of both. A bit of both. I think you have to. That's part for me as part of the design of the thing as well. So in the early days, for example, we put in loads of of um, images and pictures and whatnot. Um, and so as, as students would click their way through the course materials, they would they would click a hyperlink and then slowly, slowly they would download this picture. And the picture might be, for example, a, a, a picture of me, your lecturer. Um, and really, to have a hard look at yourself, they don't need that. They really don't need to spend 10 minutes downloading slowly a picture of me to see what I look like. Um, they could do that in a different way, or they could do, we could put a, a warning on it, you know, click on here if you want to download a picture of, of, the, of the tutor, so that they know what they're getting in advance before it just slows up their system entirely. Our, our bandwidth in the Highlands and Islands has hugely improved over the last decade, hugely improved. Um, I, I find the biggest problem we have is speaking to people out with the area. Um, 
you and I um, and, and some of the colleagues on, on, on the site just now, we've corresponded um, because of the regular correspondence between uh, Scotland and Ireland over the last little while. Um, but to be honest with you, um, there's always a slight frisson when I'm contacting, when I'm, when I'm doing a presentation to another university, sometimes big, famous universities, because their competence in using video conferencing technology, for example, is much, much less and much less aware of it. And they're more likely to screw up than we are. Uh, and they don't like to be told that they don't know how to do it properly because they think that they are Oxford or Cambridge or whatever else it is, um, when in fact we can do it much better than them. So I think you design for it. I think you also, um, you can design various courses that are offline and provide the material offline as well. So you can do a back, you can do a back version. Um, we used to use things like USB sticks, for example, with the whole material on there on a, on a, on a, on a, a format that you can navigate around and you navigate only um, on the USB stick and you only connect to the internet when you have to. So, for example, to send an email or to receive an email. Um, one of the, the gamekeeping course in UHI, which was run in from, the, from Thurzo College, um, many of the students there are actually out on estates, out on the, on the moor, hunting, you know, shooting, stalking. They don't have Wi-Fi on the, on, right at the, the fingertips. Um, but we have um, software technology that allows them to take on their tablet or on their laptop which means that when they take it back into edu Rome or, or, or into a Wi-Fi environment, it automatically downloads what they need to download, upload what they need to upload, and it's on their device. So when they go out into the moor or out into the hill, um, they have all this stuff on their device. So they can work in it in a way that they don't have to have that you know, permanent bandwidth. So you need to think about what situation you want to have these things before you, before you actually start you know, giving them material. There's no point in, it's a, it's a bit like walking into a huge big library and sent to the librarian. Hello, I'm studying archaeology. Give me a book. And they say, well, on what? On what period? Is it Byzantine archaeology or Roman archaeology or Celtic archaeology? Or, you know, you have to begin to sort of navigate the, the subject level, the content, the language and so forth. And so online learning is exactly the same as that. There's a whole variety of different ways you can do these things. Start simple, but branch out and have various options to do these things. I might come in there, Frank, and just say that there's a lot of other questions as, uh, as well there, but one that maybe ties in with what, what you were just saying there in terms of beginning simple and then branching out. Uh, an anonymous attendee, why anonymous, I'm not sure, asks, uh, what would the basic tools in your toolbox be beside the hammer? So earlier you were talking about somebody arriving to fix a washing machine with a whole bag full of hammers. So is the VLE the hammer, Frank? And, uh, and, and is all the other stuff that we plug into the VLE, the, the, the screwdrivers and other, and other tools? Well, for me, the VLE is the tool bag. Ah, it is, it is the container for all these things. Um, I've, I, I've slowly developing, pioneered, you, want to see, you might say, a, a system for course design over the years, um, and myself and a colleague, Keith, that, that Tom knows about, you may know Keith Smythe as well. Keith and I are, are, are planning to write about this actually, um, possibly over the summer, um, looking at these, how we evaluate this thing. But basically, if you I can share this with you as well. It's, if you think about a table, a matrix, and you have the weeks down one side and the left-hand side, weeks one to 10 or, or 12 or however many weeks you have in a semester, and then the columns along from left to right are a variety of different resources. And so each week has, this, has the same complexion, the same variety of different resources. So it starts off, for example, with a small piece written by me, um, and by I mean a page and a half, two pages, about what this week is about. This week we're going to discuss blah, this concept, okay? That's what about the key things are one, two, three, and four. Um, you know, here's now in column two some basic reading. Go and read chapter four of this book by Martin Weller or whatever. Okay. Next week, read chapter five and so on and so forth. Um, then you go into things like um, maybe giving you an example, so or or, or a video. So you have you have an orientation document. And then you have some background reading, which is which is core. 
then you have a video watching the, uh, uh, somebody who's talking about that particular activity. And that could be anything. That could be a TED talk. It could be a YouTube clip. It could be something you've recorded in advance yourself. It's a whole variety of these things, but it, it's basically a visual piece like this. Not a long piece, a short piece. I would say between three and 10 minutes, let's say, maybe three and 15 minutes max. The last thing you want to do is to click on a thing and discover that the, the video you've just signed up for is an hour and a half long. You think, oh my God, really? Really? Let's, you know, can we play this faster? And students are doing that. They're just playing at double speed, you know, and taking, taking fast notes. They're not learning. They're just actually skimming what's going through it. Then you give an exemplar of what you're talking about. So do you have the, the theory and the real hard concepts. Um, I like to give things what I call snippets. So, so bits of nice to know information that are related to that topic, but aren't really essential to, to, to learning about it. So, so kids, for example, love to, you know, they love to know that, you know, I don't know, spiders can jump five times their own length or, you know, the, 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 whatever rabbits breed like you know so that they, they love all these you know wonderful little quotes and facts and pills that which ties in with about how we learn and, and think about the, the the application of the the facts we're learning and then i give links to things like follow-up reading in depth journals materials for example uh, you know academic journals um, which i can add to Every time the course is taught, I can remove or add things somewhere through there. And that's to say that students don't have to read all of these things. But if you like the topic of this particular week and you want to know more, here are three or four papers that are really good that you can dig, dig into. And the keen student will read all of these things. The following week, you may not be quite so enthused about the topic of the week's conversation. So you do the bare minimum and you, you know have a quiet week. And then the following week, you go, oh, my God, this is fantastic. Well, I've discovered about such and such this week. And that's really, and so you delve into that. So they're always coming back for more information. And then finally, I, I, I sort of tail end that with um, what might be called a formative assessment, but a, a learning activity that the student can go and do without anybody else seeing it, without me needing to mark it, without me needing to comment on that. Um, quite often, so there might be, for example, um, very early on, you might get to sign up to a, a, a bibliographic management tool, Mendeley or one of these things, right? And they say, here's how we go and do it. Here's a video of how to, how to actually set, set it up and sign on your account. And here's how to use it as a, a, little, a little tutorial guide. Um, if you're interested in this, go away and do it. And then come back onto the, to the module discussion board and tell me how you got on. I don't have to know how you got on. You know, it's not it's not critical to the to the, to the learning activity, but if you want to come in and say, "Oh my God, that was so easy," I, I've been putting that off for years, and now I realise that it's like three clicks, and I was in. Wow! But as somebody else comes back and said, "Well, I tried that, but actually, you know, if the password is longer than ten letters, one, well, no, it doesn't it doesn't understand." You know, and so people can have a discussion around that and a learning activity, so that they know that they have learned something. So that they, they get that confidence factor to go in there. And so that basic grid is the same week by week by week um, as you go through there. And that's that's the smorgasbord I'm talking about. It's a variety of different things. What is the big mistake about the whole digital native thing and learning styles in particular? There are various, there are various buzzwords that really get me up, get on my soapbox. Learning styles. We all learn differently. Okay. Some people like to read. Some people don't like to read. Some people have to do it, hand, get their hands dirty and you know, get their sleeves rolled up and, and actually do it. Other people like to hear these things. Other folk must discuss and, you know, and we all do all of these things at different times. And so the myth that has grown up around learning styles is that if you find the way that you, the learning style that you prefer and teach people in that style, they will learn better. That is absolute nonsense. That is the reverse, actually, I would believe. Um, what happens is there, because you learn in the most comfortable style, then you and perhaps enjoy it more and you perhaps can, you can take refuge in a book or you can take refuge in a, in, by grabbing a spade and going out into the field and doing something. It doesn't mean you say you're actually learning. That it, you only learn when you have to make an effort. And when you make the effort, you actually remember that effort and what you've learned in that effort. And I think if you learn it easily, 
you may just lose it easily as well. So I think the learning styles thing has is, is, is been grossly simplified to the point of uselessness, I would say. Yeah, there's a lot of it around, a lot of those myths around. One more, maybe, Frank, because I know you have uh, I know you have some slides you mentioned wanting to, to share there. So kind of similar question. What do you think are the most important changes or skills which students need to be made aware of or provided with in order to study effectively at a distance? I find they uh, sometimes by necessity are an afterthought in the process of providing good distance education. So we often hear of the loneliness of the long distance learner. And we often hear, or I often hear, uh, this stuff is a bit like what you were saying earlier. This stuff is fine for postgraduates, but it's ne never going to work with undergraduates. Or this yeah, stuff yeah. is fine for humanities, but will never work for yeah. engineering or what have you. Yeah. Are there common things, common skills, common attitudes you need to give them? I think there are two things that are that are common through all. Um, so, I, 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 if we had if we had longer, or if we had a, a specialised focus on that, we could look at all of those aspects. And I, I'm quite happy to come back at any other time and look at some of these things in more detail if you if you want, because I think I think you can you can explode some of these myths. Um, I, I've spent years discussing, arguing, whatever what you want to call it, with colleagues that will say, ah, but how do you do this online? How do you guarantee this online? And my response nowadays is always, you know, very easily, how do you guarantee the quality offline? You know, how do you guarantee, how do you do that in a normal conventional class? Okay, so why do you think it's different from, from online? Do you think it's impossible to cheat in exams? Do you think it's important? I mean, pe people can buy it. So I, like, I give my students an essay. You can buy essays. You can buy essays on the web now, for goodness sake. This is not rocket science. Um, you're kidding yourself if you think that it's any different. And in fact, I think that in many cases, and I've given talks before about the quality of, of, high, of good, well-designed online courses, I think are better in many cases than face-to-face -face because you get 24-7 access, you get specialized, you can pace it yourself, you can put in layers of complexity. Um, the student, the, the slow students can look at that again and again until they get it. The faster students can actually delve and go into things that you haven't got time to go into in a conventional face-to-face -face class because you can provide that effort as well. The two things that are common to all of these things, regardless of subject material, discipline, or level, I think are twofold. One is about um, learning how to learn, L teaching people how to actually learn, the systematic process of thinking the way through. That's a good question. I don't know the answer. Let's work it out together. Yeah, that's the thing through. And I think related to that, and increasingly these days, is learning how to differentiate quality, how to spot fake news. Just because it comes online doesn't mean you say it's correct. And you, and, you know, all these conspiracy theories that have grown up can follow these things through. There's a whole variety of stuff there. We are used to it, and, and, and people of our generation now have grown up with newspapers um, from our parents, and we know that this is a good newspaper, and that's not not such a good newspaper. They, 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 they deal with a scurrilous, you know, you know, scandalous stories, and we don't we don't really want to you know waste time with that sort of stuff. Whereas this is a very highbrow paper. We don't you know we don't we don't want to read this this Tory establishment stuff. We want something that's a bit middle of the road or you know the, a Guardian or a whatever. Um, we learn that as we go through life, and the fact is, as I said last night, we're using twenty first century technology with nineteenth century etiquette means that we haven't actually learned how to differentiate just now the quality online. So we either believe everything or we believe nothing. And we have you know, we have um, representatives of both in our political sphere right now um, who believe everything or nothing. Um, and therefore, you actually, it takes harder to actually understand how to spot, uh, how to back up the evidence and how to provide the, the source material to justify your arguments, I think. And that, that's the common factor. Excellent, excellent. So I, I, I know there's something you want to get back to, but I'll share a comment. It's not a question, but a comment. 
Zed says, I just wanted to compliment Frank on his pronunciation of the word hootagogy. Sounds really cool in a Scottish accent. So <laughs> yeah, very good, very good. So did, did you have some slides you wanted to share, Frank? Was there, was there something you wanted to give us a visual on? Um, I was just going to, I was just going to, two seconds, and I'll, sh I'll share the screen. I was going to share a couple of these things that I had last night on, um, and can you see that? Yeah. Okay, so that this is the slide I had from last night. So this is, I just wanted to show you the extent of, 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 of UHI. I mean, this is, this is what I think, the stars are where the, the, camp, the main campus bases are. I'm up here, um, well, in well, fact, that I'm actually up near the tip, the very tip in the north of the Hebrides here, but the campus that I go to is in Stornoway, that, that sort of location there. Um, but right from, from Shetland down to Perth, um, Argyll, West, West Coast mainland here, Inverness is here, obviously, um, these 13 different campuses are the range of the UHI main campuses. The area of the Highland region, the Highland region mainland, is this, this area in here, is about the size of Belgium. This area here, however, is much, much bigger. And all these 100 and 110 different islands as we go through there are, um, you, you know, it, it, the island might be just within sight of you. But if the ferry doesn't go there that day, you don't get there that day. You have to think about how you plan these things, and you can't just pop down there to pick up the handouts. So, the delivery of things by by online education, part of the secret is to be well prepared. So, I think we've all done it in face to face classes. You're halfway through a session, and you think, "Hang on, I'll give you this as well." And you can take your paper and go into the corner and photocopy ten copies and bring it back and give it to the class of ten people. You cannot do that in an online. Uh, situation so easily. So you have to think in advance about the things you have to give there, the handouts you give but prepare in advance there, or follow up with, with examples, obviously you can, you can send things out afterwards. But if you want to discuss that at the time, you have to have it there. What, what sometimes is quite astonishing for people, if you look at that footprint of UHI and transfer that to the map of England, you realise that the UHI area goes from the south coast of England halfway up Scotland. It goes, it goes further north in the sky. That's a huge area. Ireland fits in that quite comfortably, the whole of Ireland. Um, and that's the area that we would call our local campus. That's all I wanted to show to you in that sense, because I think that the idea about, um, you know, why do you need, why do you need to actually bring people together? Well, if you have one of you, if you've got a, 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 a course team of five people and two of them are based here and one's based here and one's up there somewhere, you need to have ways of actually functioning together as a course team. So you have online video conference meetings, your committees are, so all the UHI committees are online. Um, at one point, you know, the early days, I used to travel back and forth to Inverness almost every week. No, I hardly go there at all. No, I don't go there at all because of the pandemic. But I mean, even, even that not be the case, I would just video conference with that nowadays. I would, I would join the committee by, by VC um, and we learn the technique of actually managing a, a, a committee that way, you don't you don't say if you've got twenty five people on the on the on the committee from all the different parts of the university, you don't say um, okay any questions because you either get a storm of questions or nothing at all because people will do well I don't I don't want to be the first to ask the question so I have to go around there and say um, let me go to Inverness any questions in Inverness and so on and so forth so you have to find a way. An etiquette, a way of using the technology that allows you to bring these things in there. And doing so, it's a much more inclusive technology than the restrictive one of face-to-face. -face. You know, under the pandemic, now, I'm, I have sat in on classes that are history classes, that are archaeology classes. Um, after I sign up from you just now, um, after I sign off, um, I've noticed that the, one of the Irish universities is giving a lecture on corn crakes this afternoon, and I've registered for that. Corn crakes are one of. Uh, I've just got a book about corn crakes coming out, in fact. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to be a, a student in that thing, we, um, you know, in, in, in this afternoon. That has um, become possible because people have been forced into the situation by the pandemic. Many people would not even have thought of making that public. 
uh, and before this event here. And so over the course of the, the last year, we have been far more collegiate, we have been far more um, sharing, and we have the public coming into some of these talks for nothing, and we have using that as a sort of leading edge technology to encourage people to come in and pick up courses. Um, I've been a fellow of the George Will Society of, Ed of Edinburgh for the last 40 something years. And the only talk I've ever been at on, in, the, in the Wednesday evening talk was the, the lecture that I gave myself about two years ago. Um, but now, because it's all online, I'm able to, on a, on, a, on a Thursday night or Wednesday night, join in with that, with that talk. And so it has made the geographical disadvantage of me not being able to go to, to, to Edinburgh just for that one hour talk on an evening, because it's going to cost me several hundred pounds. It means it's much more, more, uh, more flexible and much more egalitarian, much more aware. I think there's a lot of these things that we can do. I'm going to unshare this now and come back to you. That's great. There were some more questions uh, coming in there as well. Thanks for that. And it is useful to to, uh, to to see the map there. Connor Rock asks, any ideas about the difficulties of accessing library resources from a distance? So yes, there are online library resources, but how extensive are they? Are, are they really? And is there room for improvement? Short term access to many scholarly articles can be can be quite expensive. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff there, isn't there? Um, so yeah, in terms of access and in this terms is, of the online availability of things, this is a whole. I, I, I do a whole, I do a whole session with postgraduate research students on how to access things. There's a whole session on that as well. So what I would say is it's absolutely huge, absolutely huge. UHI subscribes to tens of thousands of online journals. Um, as I say, I've been working from from home solely for the for over the last since last the year past in February. Um, uh, I produced um, a book that I've just f f sent to publishers this week there, written entirely during that time. I've accessed hundreds, hundreds of, of, of um, uh, academic papers. Um, I think that it's increasingly easier to get information. Not only do you things are things that you have to pay for, there are an increasing number of open access journals there are things like ResearchGate, um, which you can we can register with there. And quite often people have put their journal that is available from Elsevier for £25 free on ResearchGate because they have the they have the the, the, the pre-publication you know text as it were through. Um, I found um, the book I'm working on was working within other languages. So I found that if you actually when I see a, a reference that's made to corn creeks in, let's say, Croatian or whatever else. I don't speak Croatian, um, but if I if I type into to, to the search engine, to Google or whatever, the actual title of the paper, um, whether it's in English or Irish or Croatian, um, you will find a copy of that paper. Um, and sometimes you'll find that the copy is, act the, the, the article was written in Croatian or, you know, French or whatever else it is. And if you don't speak that language, um, it's quite problematic. There may well be a summary or a, or a, a abstract in, in English that you can follow. But what I've been doing laterally is actually I bring a, I can bring up the um, the paper on my screen. I can use Google Translate on my iPhone and hover my iPhone over the screen, and I can read the paper as it goes through in those little languages. So there's a huge a huge number of actually getting access to materials online. I, I I'm I live and die. Um, professionally with the stuff I do online. And over the course of the past year, even I have been astonished how much is available. Things that I've, I've downloaded entire PhDs from, the, from different places and whatnot, all and stuff through there. Um, in some cases, I have contacted the author and said, um, I, I see you have this thing. Have you written anything else about this particular topic? And one guy came back to me from Germany with uh, not just the, a couple of papers that I hadn't seen, but also some collection of un, unpublished uh, files that you had and saying, I no longer work in this area, but you're welcome to this if you want it. Oh, my God, I've got all this new stuff that I can talk about. So I think, I think in fact, we're in danger of having too much. And I go back to my point about learning to dis distinguish what is important and what is not important and the quality of the journal and the quality of the article as it goes through, that's more important than actually being able to access to get these things online. 
Very good, very good. And I, and I would say to people, we had a previous speaker talking about open access and open educational resources, Catherine Cronin, who would be quite well known in, in the area and recommend people to go yeah. back and yeah. have a look at her talk where she actually directed people to some kind of specific uh, sites and, and sources that they could go to. Maybe one final one there, Frank, and it's close to my own heart, actually, because we're getting people asking a lot of questions about what's going to happen in September or what's going to happen post COVID or what's going to happen when we, and I hate this phrase, when we get back to normal, because I would hope we, we don't return to business as usual, but that everything we've experienced will, will inform our practice. So the question anyway is, with the eventual return to the physical campuses, uh, how do you see online learning continuing in a way to provide students with truly flexible learning options? There's lots uh, this person writes, there's lots of talk of high flex options, so high flex and high hybrid flex. and yeah, yeah. mixing different modalities and things like that. Not as much of an issue for you guys, it sounds like, Frank, but for the rest of us, perhaps. I don't think it's a big issue in that sense, but I think I think there are two or three things that are, that are worth paying attention to. I think, firstly, um, students will drive that. Students will come, come back to me and say, um, will come back to all of us and say, I can get Tom Farrelly's courses online. Why can't I get yours online? You know, I'm working, I'm, I'm stacking shelves in, this, in, in Tesco's during the day because to make money so I can so I can do this course and whatnot. So I can't come to my to your class at nine o'clock on a Tuesday morning. Have you recorded this? Can I can I look at the video from this? Well, why not? You know, that, that guy there's done it at his course. Why can't you do that? So students will actually force you into that. I was I was talking to University of Iceland a few years ago there. They were quite traditional and, and quite conservative in their approach uh, and say, we, we don't need to do that because we are the University of Iceland in Reykjavik and more people come here and they, and they come to us anyway. And I'll say, i got news for you, mate. Students in Iceland are signing up for for. for for um, courses at Open University, they're signing up for courses in Sweden, they're signing up for courses in Canada because they can get them flexibly um, online and they don't need to come to you anymore. They don't. The days are gone when you are the only shop in town. And if you don't watch it, you'll be saying, I don't want to do that, these courses because they're crap. They're old fashioned, you know, they're out of date. I don't need that sort of stuff. Secondly, in terms of the design, to go back to this thing here, this this matrix system of, of design of course of module design that I've been I've been you know, working on pushing on, I reckon I can take now. I reckon I can produce a new module from scratch in the number of weeks that it would take you months to do. So if what where it might take you. You know, traditionally, you go along to your head department, you're going to do a new course. And so one or two of you or more would go away and say, um, we want to do this new module on X, Y, Z to add to the to, to the degree program. Um, can we, you know, can we be able to get time in our, in our workload to go and design this new course? And the head of department looks at the sums and they says, yeah, yeah, OK, we can give you, you know, we can give you six months. In the next six months, you can, you can be doing this. Thing. I could do that course in six weeks now. Because I would start with open access materials. I would look at things like YouTube, like TED Talks, like Academic Earth. I would look at all the open access journals. I'd have a whole variety of things there. And I would fill these boxes, these gaps in the matrix with all these things that are really well thought out, well produced learning resources. And then with the bits that I haven't got good stuff for, then I would create them myself. So the first, in the first instance, I would be looking at what's available because there's so much available. When I began to do this 30 years ago, I literally had to go and write the book because the book didn't exist. The book did not exist. So the first thing I do was behind me somewhere. Um, I had to go and write the textbook for the course. I would never think of doing that anymore. I would, I, I would say, what is available? What can we do? And then the bits that are not available, or the bits that I wasn't happy with, or the bits that didn't cover exactly what I wanted to do there, I would say, uh, I would create this stuff myself, whether a video or whether an audio file or whether a, whether a, a written piece of text, and I would add that into the pile, and I would put that into open access material as well, so other people can then use my material as well. So I could create that course from scratch in literally three or four weeks probably. Maybe not the best course in the world, but I could get it up and running and functioning and really, really, really high improving within that time. And I think that is the difference. I think when we go back to when we go back to a campus-based format, 
we're going to say if we if we managed to get over this in the past without doing all so why are we doing this bullshit now? Well, well why why are we doing this? I was listening to a doctor in a um one of the hospitals who was um the COVID hospitals, and they say, what is the thing that you've learned over the course of this year? And he said, the course, the thing I've learned most of the, over the course of this year was that I can put an application for research ethics at five o'clock one day, and I can have the approval the next day, because it's so, there's such an urgency with the, with the, with the, the medical um, demand for, for learning about this particular. And he said, if we can do that, and we, have pro- we can do that, why does it take three months and it, we, we, well, prior to COVID? What, what, what are we doing wrong there? We're, we're tying up with red tape and unnecessary bureaucracy you know, to, to stifle the innovation. And, and that's going to change, I think. And people will vote with their feet if, if it doesn't change. That's fantastic. And that's a very good note to, to end on, I think. So thank you for such an engaging, thought-provoking and, and very, from our point of view, I think, very timely and very relevant uh, discussion and talk. I, I really think there's no replacing, you know, the kind of engaged familiarity you, you have with the whole area. So great insights, great candor, um, speaking very directly to things there. But also, look, thanks everyone for coming along. I know how, how busy everyone is, and it's really a great reflection, I think, of everyone's commitment and passion that you've been able to take and make this time. So join us next week. Or another talk with uh, Professor Laurie Phipps, who might be known to Frank actually from uh, from JISC. So thanks a million, Frank. We'll be in contact. Fantastic welcome. stuff.